Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the ChessWebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over Game 9 from the 2013 World Chess Championships between and on the current world champion and Magnus Carlsen, the young Norwegian star who is the highest rated chess player in the world and currently coming into this game has a two-point advantage with only four games left. So if he can just kind of squeak by, get some draws, then we're probably going to have a new champion. Good news for the fans, we have the most exciting chess match to show you. Not only the most exciting chess match of this entire series, but one of the most fun chess matches to watch and to analyze that I've seen in a long time. So definitely in store for a good one. A non-playing the white pieces has to play for a win, and that's exactly what he does. He comes out guns blazing. Starts out with pawn to d4. There's actually a lot of cheers when he played this. He's very strong with d4. Magnus Carlsen plays knight f6, and we come into the Nimzo Indian defense, which can be very, very aggressive from both sides of the fence, which is what we saw. Now, Anand decided to play an interesting move, which basically told me from the very beginning that he was not looking to play the standard cut-and-dry Nimzo Indian defense. He played pawn to f3, which is not something you typically see. I'm used to seeing pawn to e3. I'm used to seeing knight to f3. But pawn here to f3, I mean, it blocks off this knight on f3, but it gets ready to push forward with pawn to e4. The Nimzo Indian defense usually don't castle on the queen side, so even having this protection on the king side when you castle is look, you know, usually pretty important. But this pawn to f3 says that, you know, Anon is looking to push forward on the king side, and he's not too worried about any defense for his king side safety if he even decides to castle on the king side. Black responds with pawn to d5. Knowing that Anam wants to play this pawn to e4, just dominating the center of the board. So the pawn to d5, definitely a nice move for Magnus Carlsen. He can now get his light squared bishop involved into the game. But this kind of counterattacks the center of the board before things get too out of hand. Now we see pawn to a3. No great square for the bishop to really go to. And so Magnus Carlsen decides to go ahead and give doubled pawns here on the c-file. You don't typically in the Nimzo Indian defense want to bring your bishop back here to a5 because you're going to lose it after the pawn comes up and then this pawn pushes forward. Pushing back is a little bit too passive, especially since white has so much uh, spatial advantage. Uh, this would definitely kind of be bad for black. And so it's pretty common just to go ahead and exchange. Giving up that bishop, your opponent has that bishop pair, but giving them this doubled pawn structure right here on the c-file. This also does open up a semi-open file for the rook, so having the rook swing over here to b1 at some time, controlling this long file, um, kind of opening up the, the queen side attack is definitely something that white could do um, or he could just focus on the king side which you know it looks like he wants to do later pushing forward with e4 trying to control the center of the board and then attacking on the king side black responds with pawn to c5 trying to you know break up the center of the board uh, and Magnus Carlsen decided to take with his pawn a lot of times you'll see you know taking with the knight here this is pretty common uh, but Magnus Carlsen decided to take back with his pawn definitely one of the moves in the early of the game that actually took him quite a while to, to figure out what he wanted to do and now we see pawn to e3 kind of a waiting move not ready to go ahead and commit with that pawn to e4 but it does open up for you know this bishop to get involved into the action usually pretty common for this bishop to come to d3 and then if it wants to get more involved into the game it can definitely do that once the bishop comes outside this pawn chain then the knight can come to e3 it can then come to f4 a lot of times it comes to g3 and then the push from e4 happens so just a few things to keep in mind the dark square bishop once the pawn pushes forward to e4 can now get involved into the action you can also bring your queen involved to kind of ha add some support queen here to c2 makes a lot of sense so just a few things as both things are looking black still has the option he can castle on the queen side you know he can bring the bishop over here to f5 is a pretty common square he can bring his knight here to c6 he can bring his queen wherever he wants to castle on the queen side or he could just opt for castling on the king side decides to go ahead and push forward with pawn to c4 kind of blocking off any momentum that white may have with pushing forward on the queen side also stops the bishop from coming here to d3 which as we've already talked about is definitely something that Anon would want to do with the bishop because that's typically the square that the bishop's going to come to in the Nimzo Indian defense is the square right here on d3 now responds with knight here to e2 getting ready to again come over here to g3 
And then we see knight to c6. Now keep in mind this is very important. From here, Magnus Carlsen could just decide to go ahead and castle on the king side. But if he kind of looks at it, you know, you could see the knight come here to g3, and then, you know, you could have the pawn push forward to h5. And in this particular case, you don't want to have your king castled over here. You want to be able to attack this. So he decides to go ahead and just play knight here to c6, because now if we look at it, okay, now if the knight comes to g3, now we can go ahead and have that pawn to h5, and we're not too worried about you know, the, the king not being safe, because black can still castle on the queen side. So it's kind of a waiting move to see what exactly white's going to do, knowing that black's going to play this knight to c6 at some point in the game. So Anon plays pawn to g4, which, if you were actually watching the game, is was, was pretty exciting. Pawn to g4 is, is kind of an all-in move that says, I'm just going to push very, very quickly. I'm pretty much all in. I have to get a win here. So none of this funny business of we're going to draw after 20 moves. Someone is going to win this game. So definitely kind of exciting. Again, if you look at it, White can castle on either side, but really there's going to be no safety here. It makes more sense to castle on the king's side because you do have kind of the, the pawns in front of it. So as you push, it's going to be very tough for black to even counterattack because he's going to have to worry about protecting. But again, this is a very, very strong indicator that Anon is just going to be pushing and putting a lot of pressure on Magnus Carlsen. If I'm playing this game for Magnus Carlsen, I'm really just trying to hold on for a draw. The last thing you want to do is have Anon get a win here, being down only a point with three games left, uh, and just giving him that confidence going into the last three games. Magnus Carlsen now decides to go ahead and castle on the king side, so it's just going to be a race. If you kind of look at this, you can see that Anon has already started to attack on the king side. Magnus has decided to castle on the king side, and so now it's just time to march up here and start to attack this king on g8. We now see the bishop come here to g2, indicating that he wants to go ahead and castle on the king side. Again, the bishop usually wants to come to d3, but because it can't, the next logical square is right here on g2. Now the knight's going to come over here to a5, getting ready for a nice little outpost here on b3. This is definitely going to be tough for white to deal with, especially since we talked about this light square bishop over here on g2. It's not going to be moving it. It's kind of awkward for this knight to really get too involved. He wants to be over here on the king side, so he's not going to be able to do too much over here. Now after the castle on the king side, we see the knight come over here to b3, and then the rook swings over to a1 easy for Anon to play b1 or a2 both are completely fine b1 makes a lot of sense because it controls the semi-open file but as long as this rooks here on b1 this knight can just hang out on b3 pretty much just locks down the semi-open file so this rook here on a2 does make some sense it allows it if it needs to ever swing over to the king side it can definitely get involved very very quickly in the action now the pawn's going to push forward on b5. Magnus Carlsen recognizes, okay, Anon's going to push on the king side. What's the plan? If he just sits back and just takes it on the chin, he's going to lose this match. His only way to even fight for a draw or potentially a win if there's a blunder later in the game is to attack on the queen side. He has to. It's the only option that he really has in this game. So Anon plays knight to g3. But again, he's already played this g4, so this is even more aggressive. He can play knight here to f5 if he wants to. He can now push forward with pawn to e4, put even more pressure on the king side. Magnus Carlsen again sticking with his plan. A non-pushing on the king side, black pushing on the queen side. Who's going to end up winning in this particular game? And now pawn to g5, putting even more pressure, forcing this knight to move. The knight moves back here to e8. And then we see e4, as we talked about, kind of crushing up the center of the board here. We now see the knight take here on c1, the exchange, giving up you know, his knight for that dark square bishop. Usually, again, don't want to have your opponent with double bishop pair, especially when your opponent has such a strong attack over here. So after this takes, we have the rook swing over here to a6, trying to control, you know, stopping some of this attack that white's going to be pushing up the board right here. And then we see pawn to e5, and Anand had a lot of different options here as far as he could have played. 
I really think e5 is a fantastic move right here. It blocks off a lot of the options that black has. The knight can't come here to d6. It, it stops it on many ways from coming here to f6. It again points all this pawn structure over here to the king side, so it's a lot easier for Nan to get more of his pieces involved into the action on the king side. And he can just overwhelm his opponent, where it's going to be very, very difficult for Magnus Carlsen right now. He has most of his pieces on the eighth rank. It's, it's kind of difficult to even look at and figure out how Magnus Carlsen, Carlsen's going to hang on or counterattack in this game. We now see the knight come to c7 again, not too many squares that he can actually come to. The pawn's going to push forward to f4. Again, Anon is just pushing as much as he can over here. Magnus Carlsen has to push over on the queen side. He doesn't have many other options. And after the take, we see both sides take right here. And again, this knight over here on a6, it's kind of awkwardly placed. It can't come to c5. It can't come to d6. So it's going to have to, it made its journey all the way over here from e8. Now it's going to have to make the journey back if it wants to get involved into the action. But we see pawn to f5 again pushing forward. Both sides are continuing. And pawn to b3. So Magnus Carlsen is looking to push forward. He now has an unprotected pass pawn that White's going to have to worry about the rest of the game because this is definitely a threat. Magnus Carlsen is doing what he needs to do, attacking on the queen side. Now the queen comes up here to f4. Anon is completely all in. All of his pieces are over here getting ready for the attack. And now it's just kind of who strikes first. Who's going to be too overwhelmed for the other opponent to actually do anything? So now we see knight 2c7 again. We already talked about it. Needs to get back involved into the action. Wasn't doing too much over here on a6. And now the pawn pushes forward to f6. Few ways to really defend against this. In the particular game, we saw pawn to g6, which has its own challenges in itself. But it, you know, if we look and see pawn takes on f6, then just... You know, the knight coming to h5 has so many complications for black to deal with. It can be very, very tricky. So kind of took the safer route, although it still is very complicated in playing this pawn here to g6. Queen's now going to come to h4, getting ready to come to h6, and then to g7. Checkmate, black has to deal with this, brings his knight over here to e8. Stopping the attack here on g7. Magnus Carlsen's kind of in defense mode, but he does have this secret weapon over here on b3 if Anon ever brings his guard down. Now we see the queen come over here to h6, and then pawn to b2. Magnus Carlsen recognizes, okay, I've stopped this over here, and I'm going to go ahead and play pawn to b2, and you're going to have to respect this. And Anon says, I don't respect that at all. I'm going to play rook over here to f4, getting ready to swing over to h4, and I'm going to checkmate you on h7. Magnus Carlsen said, okay, that's a cool plan. I'm going to go ahead and play queen here to b1. And things just get crazy here. From here we have, you know, this is just analyzing the situation. Anon has the option of playing bishop here to f1. And then the rook's going to swing over to, or I guess black plays, plays queen over here to d1. Because after the rook swings over here to h4, has some something has to stop the rook or the queen come coming here to h7. This knight's gonna not gonna be doing anything. So the queen now comes up here to h5. Now we have the knight take, and then after the pawn takes, we have the rook take here. But now the bishop can come here to f5, and things are actually protected. There's now a piece that's protecting this square here on h7, but things still get pretty complicated. This is going to be very difficult for both sides to deal with. There's so many sharp variations. So again, Magnus Carlsen gets that queen, but he's forced to give it right back because of the threats that Anon has in the particular game. And again, that's kind of what both sides are looking at. Unfortunately, in the game, there was a huge blunder. Anon actually rushed in this particular case, and instead of playing what he had to of bishop to f1, he instead played knight to f1. And what he didn't realize is that Magnus Carlsen could play queen to e1, and because his knight was no longer on g3, this queen is now defending here on h4. Anon really wants to play this rook over here to h4 so he can play 
queen to, to h7. But after this, Magnus Carlsen can just give his queen back. He doesn't care too much that he just exchanged a queen for a rook because he got that queen for free down here on b1. He's got his other queen over here on d d8. So after this exchange, all of a sudden we look at it and we say, okay, Anand doesn't have any more threats. All of a sudden, Magnus Carlsen is a rook up in material. This is going to be a very easy game for Magnus Carlsen to win. So Anand, after he played this f1, Magnus Carlsen kind of stared at the board with a really weird look on his face as if to say, did you really just play f1? I, did, am I missing something? I don't understand. And then he played immediately, or not immediately, it was a few minutes after he stared at it weirdly, played queen to e1 and immediately got up and you could actually hear the Norwegian cheering section going crazy because everyone kind of realized that this match had been won. So after the queen to e1, Anand decided to go ahead and resign. Magnus Carlsen goes up three points with three games left in this series, meaning that if for the next three games Magnus Carlsen can even tie and get half a point he will be the new world chess champion, which is, I think, fantastic for the game. Such a young, bright star that, as we can see in these particular games, all out of nowhere can pull Rabbit out of his hat. Is always aggressive when he needs to be. Is extremely good in the end game. All of his games I really enjoy watching. So, again, game nine. Magnus Carlsen wins it. Goes up three points in this particular match. Hopefully, you guys watching this series. I'm excited to see the next three matches just to see if they go out guns blazing or what it's going to look like. But I think we're going to have a new world champion in the very near future. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.